Hello everyone, you're on an all new segment called Filmmakers, and our first guest is award-winning filmmaker Chris Barcia of Dark Mind Productions. His latest film, The Citrine Gaze, is out right now, and it's already won its share of awards. He's also done films such as Witness, Misdirection, The Window to My Soul, Simple Wishes, and Mortal Kombat Fate's Beginning. It was an honor speaking with him, and here is our interview. For any aspiring filmmakers out there, take a listen and enjoy. For our first guest here, we have Chris Barcia. How are you doing? Uh, doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Yes. Now, you may know he's uh, in charge of Dark Mind Productions. He's done wonderful films like Misdirection, Witness, Simple Wishes, Eyeless Jack, and more to come. (laughs) (laughs) I know. Every filmmaker's like that. And, you know, I I think it's just something in the blood of a filmmaker just to tell stories no matter what it is, whether it's through writing, production, whether it's as an editor in post-production, you know. You just have to get that creativity and just, like, imagination out there. And, you know, the arts and film in general is something that just unites us all as the human race, you know, whether it's literature, paintings, music. Film is that outlet for the human condition, I feel. And it's important because, like, like individuals, films and the filmmakers, they're, they bring their own perspective to the world, their own voice. And I want to ask you, uh, what inspired you to become a filmmaker, and what films did you enjoy watching as a youth? Boy, so it's a uh, it's a long answer to that one, but to to keep it condensed, what inspired me was uh, it goes back to just my academics growing up. I was never I wasn't a super straight A student, but I necessarily wasn't like a flunker either. I kind of just coasted through school and just did what I had to do, and I always expected to be a business major. And in college, I started really diving into that because, you know, that's where you're like, all right, you got to decide to do something and start catering your academics to what you're going to do career-wise. And I found very quickly that I despised (laughs) business, and (laughs) I just did not belong there. I just... If I hated, I always wasn't really the biggest fan of, like, going through schoolwork. And then in college, when I started doing business classes and the math, it just killed me. I was like, I got to change to something else. And ironically, how a lot of times as a kid, what I would do to pass time, my older brother would always show me movies from when he grew up. And he was an 80s yeah. kid. I'm a 90s kid. So he would show me things like the original Ghostbusters and what it was like for him and things like the Lost Boys and just all kinds of cool stuff that, you know, I would probably have encountered on my own eventually, but I would have saw it differently. I felt I was more raised on these things. And I happened to speak to him the day I was changing my major. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do, man. And he was like, yeah, you'll figure something out. And I just was thinking about all the times my brother would take me to the movies and all the things he showed me. And like a sign from God, there was a sign saying, now offering cinematography major wow. at my school. It's like, that's interesting. I could just give it a shot, you know, and see what's going on. Switched it up, got into the class. And for the first time in my life, academically i felt like intrigued in the classwork and to learn and it wasn't anything intricate they were just talking about this is a community college and they're just talking about classic movies and things like that and but for whatever reason it really grabbed my attention and a long story short on that aspect that school didn't really offer me much to go beyond that and i couldn't afford an actual film school because this was just community college so I got stuck between a rock and a hard place. I ended up choosing to drop out of school, which, you know, to all the people listening, I don't recommend you do. <laughs> I do recommend finish school, <laughs> get your degrees and do that. But that passion for the subject stood there, and I didn't want to let it go. So I chose to start looking into it on my own, and I ended up falling into self-teaching. I ended up looking everywhere. I looked up what curriculums were being taught in other schools. What does this mean? The terminology, the thing, Google, 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 everything. And then, uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history. I started working uh, at a a movie theater to pay for my first camera. And then once I got that baby, I kept on just going on to it. I kept on 
every video I did with the cameras that I got all the way up to now, I would make a video and ask myself, why does my video not look like a Hollywood movie? What is that big budget money being spent on? And what does that do for the movie? How is that camera doing that image? And I just kept doing that all the way to, to where I am now. I love that, man. And it's funny because, like, a lot of us filmmakers, we're not very good at math, surprisingly. Like, that's just one thing where it's just like... It, yeah. It, it gets to us, but, like, you're the definition of, like, it's not what you have, but what you do with what you have that matters. And, I mean, yes. Dark Mind Productions is a product of that. And I want to know what exactly brought on the creation of Dark Mind Productions after you decided you were going to become a filmmaker testing out different cameras, shooting films, like what brought on the production kind of studio, your own indie studio? What brought on Dark Mind Productions? Well, what brought on Dark Productions, so as I was researching things, this was almost like eight to ten years ago. I'm 30 now, and this was when I was like 21, 22. And YouTube was at its peak with, you know, everyone kind of doing their own thing and starting their own channels and getting their own stuff. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not doing uh youtube content i want to make narrative films and then i started looking into those things and youtube was like the, go the golden key if you weren't hired by disney or universal do it to yourself on youtube so i saw that people would start calling themselves so-and-so productions or so-and-so studios and then the indie market was there and that's how i got introduced to that kind of lifestyle so i was like i need something for myself i was like right. what is me because I've always had a thing about being authentically myself, uh, whether it be through my opinions or how I used to dress. So I was in the emo <laughs> phase. I had the spiked hair and everything. You know, it's just very much like I have to be me with this. And what are the things that I like? And I've always seen, I said, because people would ask, I was like, oh, you like scary stuff and everything. And I was like, I do, but that's not the only thing that I am. But those things have made me a very cynical <laughs> realist <laughs> and I, I tend to look at things with that that mindset through, through a cynical a cynical perspective and i was like you know that's a this is kind of like a really dark mindset and everything and i was like oh wait hold on it's a click there and i was like this, i have a dark mind and, and i was like yeah dark mind productions and i saw to see if anyone had the name and there wasn't anybody really doing dark mind productions and I ended up making, I had the logo made, and it just, everything kind of clicked. And I was like, yeah, this feels like me. If I put that in front of a movie, I was like, they know it's myself, it's me. And to this day, I, I stick with that same Dude, thing. I love that. And yeah, YouTube was like the Wild West back then. Like, it was really something. And even with fan films, with like Batman Dead and some of the Bat in the Sun yep. stuff, uh, uh, it was just amazing then. And uh so with like horror films is there any other genres are there any other genres you would like to tackle outside of the horror genre from this dark mind <laughs> oh plenty of them so i've always because a lot of people have said because you're a horror director and i was like no i'm just a director who happens to do horror i love all genres of filmmaking some more than others of course but yeah i want to tackle everything the Horror is just uh, the little secret of horror. Horror is the art of making cheap things. <laughs> so when you work on the low-budget side, horror is a little bit more tangible than, yeah. let's say, something like action. Because you need a lot more resources to do action. Not that it's impossible, but when you're looking, it's like, hey, you know, I got just a couple things here. I could make a really, really, really short action thing and just kind of that's all that I could really do. Or I could do a longer horror piece for the same price and I go with that content. But I think a genre I really want to tackle next would be film noir and kind of bring back the, the classic thrillers and that kind of... That would uh, be great. We that. need a lot of, like, neo-noir films, you know? Like, go back to, like, the heyday of the 30s yes. and stuff, stuff like Maltese Falcon and stuff, and bring it back to the oh, modern yes. age. And with the world the way it is, I'm like, I think that would be the perfect genre to tackle right now. Like, there's a lot to be said with that. Now, um... Outside the genre of films, you know, you work with a lot of the same actors with Mauricio, Adriana. Is there any, like, other actors you would like to work with, like, I guess, major Hollywood actors? What, what would be a dream actor or actress you would love to work with someday? Oh, boy. 
So, I mean, there's there's plenty that are fantastic and talented out there. I think a dream actor I would like to work with is just probably a little cliche. I think Johnny Depp really transforms into his characters and the way he views acting. He knows how to put himself while also transforming at the same time. And I think that he just kind of brings a magic to anything that he's in there. And that's I love that kind of collaboration where if I put a signature stamp on something and he's a part of it, or, and this goes for any actor I would work with, they could bring something to the table that only they could bring. You know, I think that's fantastic. I think that that's going to strengthen the, the story more than anything because they, you can never replicate that. That's how, If someone tries to do it again, they're going to say, oh, you're doing this, but they're not going to be like, that's a unique thing because that could only be done by that one person. And I, I find that fantastical. I love that. Um, you know, we talked about your genres of films, films you grew up with. Is there any filmmaker that you look up to or you would regard as your favorite filmmaker? I mean, there's, there's so many there's cause when I was teaching myself stuff, I, I kind of, you know, waned off of, uh, or weaned off of the modern movies and started looking strictly at classic stuff and, uh, one of my favorite directors uh, happened to be Billy Wilder. He did uh, something like It Hot, uh, Bringing Up Baby, and just so many, The Apartment. He, I think him being a writer-director, he really knew how to structure a story. And just seeing, this was before internet days. This was before you could call up your friend across the nation. I mean, look at us, right. we're Skyping here in different states. He only had his life experience and those around him. And he was able to tell stories that touched the masses. You know, the his movies are amazing. They're they're very artistic, and I think that he's someone that really, really inspired me. In uh, especially with his film Double Indemnity, that noir. You know, I I just find it so powerful. He was able to put love, passion, and darkness all in a story. Uh, another person would be Fritz Lang, who, if Hitchcock is the master of suspense, Fritz Lang was the master of darkness. His uh, noirs were just always <laughs> horrible, <laughs> like in the in the best way. There was such subject matter, you know. His actors weren't glamorous. He didn't choose, you know, gorgeous people. He chose average-looking people on purpose, and put them in very real situations that just go awry, and it's interesting. And I was like, you know, there's a reason why I want to watch this. And for myself, I was like, you know, dark. we as humans love dark subject matter. And I find that, you know, to be super interesting. And what I end up thinking is coming from those filmmakers, I think that they understood that everyday life right. is kind of boring and people want to escape. So if you could give them that crazy situation in whatever story it is that you're telling and make it relatable... You know, it makes people want to stick to it, no matter how horrible it is. They they want to see what it is, and they want to tell their friends about it, and they want their friends to see whatever it is that they saw. Because if it was too normal, they'd fall asleep. They wouldn't want. You're not giving them that escape. And I think that those filmmakers really, really inspired me. If I had to choose a modern day filmmaker, I think Robert Eggers is really on the right track with his work, and he's bringing art house to a whole new level where you know he's touching great audiences with his work and from the witch to the lighthouse the northman all visual masterpieces to my oh, yeah. at least in my opinion i think that he's one of the most uh, aesthetic filmmakers out there today that's really bringing art house back and he definitely sure. and you know it's like a great filmmaker you can always like tell like you can always tell that they made a certain film they have a certain style the way it looks like you can tell what's a michael mann film or a robert eggers you know or a christopher nolan like you could definitely tell their work mm -hmm. and i want to the audience to know about your new film it's just won some awards i, I think it's fantastic uh, let us know the inspiration behind your new film please tell us the inspiration behind the citron gaze so it's really funny with how those things come to be so uh myself and uh, our, my lead producer in that movie Vinny Velardi, we were going to work together on a right. project that ended up falling out and we were pretty bummed out about it and it wasn't something that i was going to direct i was just going to dp it and he was a part of it as a as a producer and when that ended up not coming through we were like you know this kind of sucks because we had all this time blocked out for work and then we were like, yeah, so I guess we're not going to be doing a film this summer. And I was like, you know, man, I was like, 
we could do something or whatever. And Vinny was like, you know, I've always wanted to do this werewolf story. And he gave me just a very vague concept. He's like, I just have a scene in my head and these kind of characters. And he told me like a little bit of uh, the premise. Like, he's like, he sent me his little, not a script, but like kind of a one sheet describing what he was thinking about. And I asked him, I was like, I think I could turn this into something. Would you mind if I expanded that story and kind of molded it a bit? And he's like, have at it, dude. Within the, the next week, I sent him back the Citrine Gaze. And, you know, it evolved into this whole thing. And I was like, this is possible. Let's talk about, do you, would you want to do this? And he's like, I think we can. I think we could film this this summer if we really got together and just kind of went for it. And then so I called up my, you know, go-to actors. He called up actors on his end. And it was just a big melting pot between his connections and my connections. And before you know it, within a month, we're out there in, in, the, in Wayne County in Jersey filming in this park that we were able to get permits to go film there and we're we're shooting a werewolf movie and it's just it just came to as simple as that it really wasn't anything outlandish that drew me to it or anything it just happened by two friends having a conversation and it just kind of kept snowballing into something bigger. i love that i absolutely love that and it's there's no better experience than making films with friends really and uh, i want to know like i guess with those connections like how did you first meet like Mauricio from Movie Minders and Real Reveal. How did the, like, y'all got that, but did y'all work on anything before? Or is it just, like, mutual friends and y'all came together before this film, or...? It's uh, it's interesting. The roadmap to all that is it's a lot of bouncing between different friends. So, uh, once upon a time, I was working at a little restaurant called Cheesecake Factory just to kind of pay some bills. And I happened to meet this uh, busboy that was there. Cool guy, and we're chatting. And I'm telling him how, you know, yeah, I'm starting to really get into films and, you know, putting my work out there. And he saw, I forget what, I think he saw Simple Wishes. And he goes like, wow, dude, like I was really impressed by that stuff. He's like, you know, I know this guy who does what you do. And I'm like, like, as in what, like he's, he put stuff on YouTube or anything. He goes, he just does what you do. And he left it at that. <laughs> it's like, okay, weird. It, on the other side of things, and I found out later from Mauricio, Mauricio knows this busboy, and he would go to the gym with him, and he was having the same conversation. He goes, Mauricio, look, I know this guy who does what you do. And he's like, well, who's this guy? He goes, Trust me, he does what you do. And this went on for like two months of him saying this, and I was like, this, this, are you just making a joke at this point? So finally, I like cornered him, and I was like, if you know the guy that does what I do, give me his contact info, and I'll reach out to him myself. So I shot uh, Mauricio an email at his movie minders uh, email, and I was asking, you know, I was like, yo, apparently, you know, we do the same thing. Let's uh, let's link up and talk shop and see what's good. And you know, he we set up a time. We ended up meeting up with each other and just kind of really hit it off. And he was a cool dude. And uh, he was the one who also yeah. knew Real Reveal, which is Theo, and uh, he's in Canada. And then it just kept snowballing into those little connections like that. Like, oh, I know someone, and then this person knows this person, and I'll introduce you to that. And, like, the web started just interconnecting. And it's uh, it's funny now because it's, like, it's just odd that it happened that way. But, yeah, it's Dude, it's a It's a small like world we live yeah, in, Buster, uh, really. <laughs> oh, yeah. Literally because a buster said uh, he does what you do, and that's <laughs> that's where all those connections. If this was a movie, it'd be like that scene in an Ant Man when like Michael Pena's character is talking about like, oh, I met this one guy, and then it'd just be like this whole like story that's getting told on screen. <laughs> I just I, I love that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now with this new film, would you ever want to like continue or explore this universe in the future, or is this like a perfect standalone little short film? Well, when I first was writing it and expanding uh, Vinny's idea, we were chatting about it, and you know there was a lot of things thrown back and forth, and uh, eventually what we ended up settling on, settling on with the script, and we're like, you know, this is pretty solid. We were just more focused on just making the movie more than anything, and the plan was, okay, when we finish it, we'll start pitching it to people, go to executives, see what they think about it, and kind of just go from there. We didn't really have a structured plan, and now... The film, honestly, has been getting so much, you know, commentary and a lot of praise, which I find always surprising. You know, I put the work out there, I put heart in, into it, and hope it entertains people, and that's where I kind of 
expect anything to blow up. That's not why I, I do what I do. But the amount of attention from the cast and crew when they've seen the final product to their friends and family to other people they've shown it to who end up telling, uh, even just this morning, Mauricio is telling me people that, you know, someone he ran to saw the movie and they think that this should be a feature film and they were asking questions as it go on. And it, it's definitely raised the the curiosity, if I will, that between me and Vinny, we've been chatting and we're like, you know, we really could explore this universe. We could expand it. And uh, we've been going back and forth on what it could possibly be. And, uh, yeah, I think it would be pretty cool to expand that universe and kind of see a feature-length version of Citrine. Uh, y'all also screened it at a theater. How? What was it like? Was that the first time you screened one of your own films, like, in a private little theater? Or? Yeah, that would be the first private screening I've done. I've seen my work at film festivals that have had live screenings. Uh, my, my first... Uh, project was a fan film of Mortal Kombat. I got to see that in an AMC theater, but that was at a film festival going on in uh, in New York. This particular one, we were able to go to Center Cinemas in Rutherford, New Jersey, and um, the the guy running that theater there, Sean, great guy. You know, he gave us a really good package, and the the people that got involved with Citrine on the film, the cast and crew, I really wanted to give back to them because. One, I put them through a very strenuous activity, only filming in two nights, the the whole movie. Whoa. Yeah, and it was that's that was, should have been like a week long film because it's a twenty three minute runtime. It it's a lot to kind of run and gun for everything, and and overnight at that, it you know it was very exhausting for them. So I promised them, I was like, hey guys, like this is gonna be worth it. You're gonna get to see your work on a theater screen, and that was always the plan from the beginning. Is like I'm gonna get this out there some way somehow. And uh, when we went to Center, Center Cinema, Sean set everything up for us. He got it, you know, converted to the appropriate format and everything. And I'm thinking, you know, we're going to have like 30, 40 people. We were able to actually shell out between friends and family and word of mouth. We filled almost 85 seats in the theater. We almost got a full pack theater oh. on that. And it's, it's really surreal. You know, and that's the first time because it's solely everyone came just for our film. They came there to see the Citrine gaze. They knew what they were getting into. And that was just, uh, it felt really like a good family moment. And that, you know, that's, I cherish that above any other screening I've had at a festival or any award. Everyone that I care for and work with got to get together, have a good time, and watch on a full theater screen, an actual professional screen, the movie that they poured their blood, sweat, and tears into over a year's time from those two nights after waiting two nights and then waiting a whole year for it to screen wow the it was really surreal that's man. that's rewarding experience right there it really is i think it's a great creature feature film it goes back to like a little bit of like evil dead there's some new stuff that was out like prey and the video game the quarry and it's weird because y'all filmed it like a long time ago but there's like a lot of modern media lately that reminded me of the film like you're really kind of touching on something with this film and um i want to know before i get into like what the night shoots were like uh, as far as the effects who did the artwork for like some of the transition scenes because you kind of have like some like storyboarded kind of motion graphic art in the film uh how did that come about so yeah, so that was something that I didn't necessarily intend to do right off of the back. Oh, wait, I might be paused there. Oh, okay, got your back. There was a glitch in the oh. screen. For me. <laughs> Bro. Yeah, no, you're good. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I never, originally I wasn't intending to use that kind of artwork transition, and it kind of came to me on set the way that that would kind of go into with the, the whole prophecy of the film. And I was like, you know, this could really work. So our storyboard artist first, uh, Michaela, who, you know, she's very, very talented. And she's based in the Midwest. And she was working remotely to send me these storyboards. But, you know, she's a very talented artist. If, uh, if anyone wants to check out her work, it's technically Dead Girl on Instagram. She does amazing everything. <laughs> I can't even single out a particular thing. A lot of neon stuff and crazy good thing so i had gone to her and i was like didn't kind of giving me a couple renditions of what's going on here and then i also because she was very busy and i also had my assistant director who is emily casey another very talented artist and individual that girl is a very very talented filmmaker i love working with her she was able to design the poster and then uh, she also was giving me some of these cards that in her art style of just different things of civil and 
all that I was like, if you get me that artwork with whatever blending these these styles in together, I will put the effects on it and kind of make it make sense. And I just gave them a very loose description of what was happening, of what the prophecy described, and this and that. And they knocked it out the park. Uh, like the stuff they got, I was like, this is so cool. I've always been a fan of just handmade art in general, and you know, they they killed it. They they really really brought it to another level. Me putting the effects and everything, I was like, it's all their work just handshaking together. Like it, it, I'm I'm literally clicking buttons for effects. They're the ones that put that magic on the screen, and it worked out so well to me. And I'm really proud of them for for adding that element to there because it's it, it's just super cool to me that that you don't see authentic handmade art necessarily make its way into movies much anymore. And I've always been a fan of that, so I'm I'm proud of them. That's just fantastic. You know, films are also just like a great collaboration process between a lot of people. It's not just like one person. It's a collaborative effort. And I just think it's great when it all just comes together and just clicks and everything is just like firing on all cylinders, you know. Um, going with that in the werewolves, spoiler, anybody who hasn't seen it, <laughs> um, <laughs> what was what were the challenge? Like you said you took about two days to film it like two nights that's mm -hmm. I, that surprised me i thought it was like a week or something that's even more amazing but like what were the challenges dealing with the werewolf effects like how much was like the person like and the the makeup and like suit and how much was like the editing process like when the werewolf would like super speed and stuff like what was that like the challenges there so originally the werewolf his costume we had bought a very cheap uh fur suit like kind of like a regular like human sized dog suit for like uh what do they call it mascot events and everything it was really happy head on it and we ended up taking that head off and using another mask that also emily casey my ad used her art skills to kind of touch up and you know bring in a little more flair and she originally was going to have a lot more of the fur get crazier and she tried to put it in the washing machine, and it came out looking like a poodle. <laughs> so <laughs> on set, she showed me the bodysuit, and I'm like, oh, God. So all those plans where this wolf was going to do this, this, and that, I was like, I can't show that because now he's going to look not very scary. He's going to look like he came out of, a, you know, like a perm thing and have, like, a nice like, set of fur. So she did what she could to kind of rough up his bodysuit a bit, and I really had to get creative and go back to what I knew in my storyboards that I was like okay let's see if this shot was going to be this how can I hide him now how can he be less without not being in the shot at all and ended up being an elevated effect it goes back to you know self-taught film school they always teach you the, yeah. the principle that less is more and I was like well you know he's got a really scary face and the teeth are there and everything let's get close-ups of him let's only show him in corners and if he has to be full body, he's in the shadow. And then at the end, well, I mean, I guess, yeah, spoiler alert. You know, at the end, he was never supposed to come out of the werewolf form. It was always going to be in a werewolf. In the original script, he was always in werewolf form. The mask was supposed to, we were going to find a way to make the mouth move so that the audience would get startled because this wolf would suddenly speak out of nowhere and have that deep voice. But I was like, I can't have him walking around with the poodle outfit because he's immediately going to, you know, become less scary. So uh, the actor in the werewolf costume, Ray Von Garvin, another talented actor, uh, the, on set the day of, I just happened to ask him, I was like, would you want to get on camera for real? And he was so like, all right, I'm down. You know, he'd been running around in that suit the past two nights, like the whole time they were there. He's like, yeah, I'm ready to get out of it. And uh, he was just down the clown so same lines and everything just now he's in human form so uh, that was all him the voice that was all like all <laughs> him i believe that you are the light of alpha the prophecy has foretold holy all cow man voice. that voice he, he was like just... demonic that was I, I loved that voice i was wondering how you did that if it was just like his regular voice or was there some like post-production work but that was all him that was all him he <laughs> I found out he could do that voice, but before I cast him, we were talking and uh, we were talking <laughs> about Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat, and he gave me like his impression, and he did like that deep 
Mortal Kombat fatality voice, and I was like, <laughs> where did that come from? And he was like, that's just something I do. <laughs> I was like, fatality. <laughs> I'm kidding. Just like that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you have to use that voice. And yeah, he, he brought his A-game as well. You're Rayvon, you know, running around that thing, doing the voice. You know, everything on that film just kind of meshed so perfectly to me. It's, it's unreal sometimes when you think back on Dude, it. Dude, that's just amazing. And I actually did not know this till now, but you directed a Mortal Kombat short? Yes, uh, that was my first. That was almost that was 2014. Wow. Yeah, so I did a, a Mortal Kombat fan film uh, based off of the original two games. And that was my first big project ever. Like that was the first time I got to work with a crew and a DP and and everything instead of just kind of myself <laughs> running with a little camera. And yeah, that, was, that that's a that's a whole other experience. <laughs> that's what I'm, that's the movie that made my bones. Now, would you say history. Mortal Kombat would be a dream project? I'm just curious, like if you had to do something based on like another IP or, or like something like a film, like a remake or something. What kind of world or what dream project would you love to make? Oh, Mortal Kombat was definitely one of them. I'm a huge fan oh, yeah. of Mortal Kombat since I was a kid. Yeah, all the original games and even the the nineties movie and all that. I love all that. I used to know the lore, like the back of my hand and all the characters and everything. Like that would definitely be a dream project to kind of bring to life. Oh, that Spawn, Spawn. Todd McFarlane Spawn. Like I remember the ninety seven film and then there's the HBO series. Oh yeah, so like I used to watch that. I've seen those so many times. Like I used to watch it. I still watch. It. <laughs> yeah, New Line <laughs> Cinema. There, that in Mortal Kombat, and like I think for us '90s kids, because I was born in the '90s as well. Like Mortal Kombat, like the original arcade games, and like the first computerized one, Mortal Kombat Four. It's just something with the zeitgeist around that time. I don't know what it was, man. It's like there's Ninja Turtles, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and then there's like Mortal Kombat that just took the world by storm. Then you got techno music with the 95 film and even though 97's like annihilation even though it's not up there with the first like that's still a fun film <laughs> yeah it's very fun uh, yeah because you you look back at them now and you're like oh there's a lot of cheesiness in them and stuff like that but it's all in in good fun of things you know annihilation had like more characters in it and you got to see more fights than the first like you know maybe the script isn't the best and <laughs> there's some corny editing things in there and and cgi dragons but a bad cgi dragon yeah, as, but it's it's fun yeah i remember those dragons looking a lot better when i was younger and then i recently rewatched it i was like oh this did not age well like i remember this looking a lot better and more epic than it, it does right now <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Millennium. you know like those films had like an iconic soundtrack there's so many songs and a song doesn't necessarily make or break certain films. You can like have your own original scored music, but if there was like a licensed song that you had the rights to use in a movie, what would it be? Ooh, a licensed song, or a couple if you can't think of just one. Just, just like what was what was some? Oh, a couple. So let's see. Definitely would be something like aesthetic. And I, since I always deal with, you know, obscure things and everything, one movie I'm a fan of the soundtrack was uh, Queen of the Dam. Oh, hell so yeah. So I think I would license uh, either some Disturbed stuff or Static X music, which I think could fit a real aesthetic vibe to, you know, make something unique. Uh, I would definitely, in Citrine, we were able to license from Samantha Stone the song that Sybil and Blaze play here on the radio that's supposed to be right. their song. Samantha Stone was super cool for letting me use her song, and you know she was able to license it out for the movie. And uh, I got to you know get on like a nice like Skype call with her, and she was super cool because I also like her music. I would definitely license more of her music in in movies if she let me because it's just super talented and awesome. But yeah, those those are what I would go with. That's awesome. And um, you know you, you you said at one time you started with a smaller camera, moved up. Like, what kind of camera would you love to use? Like, are you using a Black Magic camera right now in some of the movies, or that's uh, my go-to uh, camera that I use on my projects now. I use a Black Magic Pocket 4K, and then uh, I cater lenses to the story, whichever set that I pair it with to make the look. Uh, the first cam that I, uh, first professional cam like I said I used was a DSLR uh, the 5D Mark II 
and that was like the indie wave when it first came out and everything and when i got that camera i got to use a full frame sensor and see how everything changed up a camera that i would love to use by today's standard is got to be alexa r oh. i mean those that's industry standards those things are unbeatable i i love i i was around one of them one time and <laughs> other filmmakers with me like don't touch it costs like millions of dollars and i was just like but that thing was it was like a relic it was like it was like looking at the ark or something you know like i was just like this this thing is i mean i feel like if i grabbed it a boulder would come out and try to smash me like an indiana jones or something <laughs> like seriously <laughs> No, those things really are they're, they're like thor's oh hammer. yeah like, you're not, you're not worthy not worthy you. <laughs> you're not pick it up. <laughs> now what would you Wait, no yeah it's always great I, I love that how you use that with cameras and again proving that like you, you basically use what you have whether it's people location story you use what you have and i want to know like because like there's high and low moments as with anything but like as a filmmaker what do you enjoy the most about the filmmaking process what I enjoy the most of the filmmaking process, it's two things. There's one, the the physical filming of the of the project. Like, just after all the planning, the talking, the discussions, and you see it right there in front of you, and you're about to call action, and you just watch out something that, whether it's through your direction, your writing, or through your framing, or whatever it is, it was started in your mind, and you're watching it play out in front of you like that's it's a really really surreal feeling when you can step out of your own mindset and be like wow okay the, we're, we're, this is happening that and then finally releasing a project after it's all after you've watched it 10 million times you could quote it in your own movie back to back like minute for minute and then it finally comes out that feeling knowing that it's been released whether it's good or bad or like you know people love or hate it it's out there in the world you did what other people have failed beforehand. Other people say, you know, that's too hard. I don't have money, so I can't do this. We don't have this, you know, Olivia Munn won't be in my movie. I can't do the movie now because it was only meant for her. Or some thing that, you know, we hold ourselves back from, from mentally, uh, or whether it be confidence or whatever a filmmaker is struggling with. When you release that movie, you've completed a journey where other people have not been able to make it to. Right. And that fuels you to do the next project, and that's that's my favorite thing that's going on because it's just a you know going the distance. It's like a Rocky. Fight. Oh, totally. You know, you, you made it to it's... the end. Win or lose, you made it there. You got in the ring, you did, you gave it your all, and you'll do it again. You get up and go out. Yeah, and I was speaking to you earlier about like each film being a learning process, and I think we just grow. But all not only that, when you complete a project, it inspires other people outside of Hollywood, other indie filmmakers, you know be like you know what if they can do it i can do it and it gives them the confidence to try something and i think in a world we have enough people saying like why are you doing this we should be like why not like let's just see what happens the worst yeah. that could happen is nothing or the best that could happen is you go the distance and have a film and you know yeah oh just yeah and since you've done that i'm just curious if you can give away any info you don't have to, but uh, are there any projects you're working on next, or you would like to work on next? Oh no, <laughs> there's a there's quite a handful of uh, projects now. The next step for for myself as a filmmaker is to essentially complete my my pilgrimage, if you will, to make a feature right. film. Now you know I've been doing this for quite a few years now. I have a few shorts out. I'm now an award winning director and cinematographer. I think it's finally time to use those resources for a long haul and you know go the distance on a feature film because that's that's just the next tier that's what's coming out there just to keep on growing keep on going on the journey dude i would watch a feature film of yours seriously i i love all your work uh, i love like movie minders riverville and then dark mind productions for a dark mind you have some sick stories that I absolutely love. I think people would love. You should definitely check out Dart Mind Productions. And, uh, yeah, I can't wait to see what you come up with next on this journey. And, uh, yeah, what, what else can I say? That's all I wanted to ask on this interview. So is there anything you wanted to add? Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. If it, whoever's listening out there, if you're thinking about doing a movie and you're worried about it or you're scared 
or you're wondering if you should or shouldn't, I say do your best. And even if your best isn't what you thought it was going to be, take the journey. Go out there and just make your stuff. Tell your stories. Use whatever you have. And don't let anything hold you back. And of course, if you do, if anyone comes with you on the way, respect them, take care of them, and form a family together in that kind of crew mindset. Get places together and just go make more movies. I think that's all that I could. I'd really want anyone to know from if I leave anything in this world from a philosophy of filmmaking is band together and tell stories. Just do what you got to do to get it out there. Wise words, man. You can follow Chris at Dark Mind Productions on Instagram. And is it Dark Mind Productions on YouTube as well? Yes. I'll leave the links down in the description below. Be sure to check out the films. In the meantime, uh, I, I don't know. That's a really great ending. I can't top that. Like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me, man. Oh, well, thank you. Thank time you for here. this opportunity of interviewing. And yeah, I can't wait to see what you do next. Seriously, we need more filmmakers and voices out there. And you're amazing. I can't wait to see what you do next. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Flawless victory, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, in the meantime, check out Chris's work, everyone. Uh, and that does it for this first segment of a Filmmaker's Podcast. Thank you, Chris, for being our first guest here. And uh, yeah, everyone stay safe and healthy out there. Till next time. And also, uh, get off your ass and film something, filmmakers. Please just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, everyone. <laughs> that was my interview with Chris Barcia. In the meantime, be sure to follow him at Dark Mind Productions on YouTube and Instagram and check out his work. Remember everyone, it's not what you have that matters, it's what you do with what you have. Now go out there and make a movie.